So hello everyone. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, welcome to the to the seminar next in our seminar series for tapas tackling air pollution uh, at school. Um, this is uh, part of our seminar series in the autumn of uh, 2021. Um, and uh, for those of you who are returning, welcome back to our seminar series. And for those of you that are new, uh, I'm uh, pleased to have you along. Uh, we're going to start in a few minutes. Before we do, uh, just a couple of housekeeping announcements to make. Um, first of all, to say that uh, this uh, seminar is being recorded. So if you do not wish to be part of the recording, uh, please uh, turn your um, leave your camera off and stay on mute. Um, please also note that in the chat, we've asked you to have a pen and paper, piece of a pen and a piece of paper ready for the proceedings today. So please, uh, please do that. Um, as usual, uh, we're going to uh, ask you to put your questions in the chat, uh, and I will uh, moderate those at the end of the of the proceedings. Okay, so. As many of you know, TAPAS is uh, an interdisciplinary network looking at uh, air quality in schools. Um, and uh, we're very pleased on this occasion to be joined uh, by uh, Sarah West, uh, who is part of TAPAS, and, uh, and Heather Price. Um, so Sarah is the director of the Stockholm Environment Institute uh, at the University of York. And she's been bringing diverse groups into research using citizen science approaches uh, for the past uh, 13 years. And she's, uh, as I said, part of TAPAS and works in our focus area four on dissemination and communication. And Heather Price is a lecturer in environmental geography at the University of Stirling. Uh, the aim of her research is to find new and creative ways to reduce environmental pollution and improve public health by undertaking research that pays very little attention to disciplinary boundaries. She's recently taken on a new role as the UK RI Regional Clean Air Champion in Scotland. And she'll tell you a bit more about that at the end of the talk. So it's a great pleasure to have you both uh, uh, as our speakers today. Um, uh, I know Heather's going to share her screen uh, and she and Sarah are going to uh, talk uh, uh, into between themselves throughout the whole of this presentation. It's a great pleasure to have you both. And I'm just going to step aside now and let you share your screen, Heather, and go from there. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'll just get this shared now. So hopefully you can you can all see the, the slides there. Yeah, that's, that's um, great. thanks Thank for you. the introduction, Paul. Great. Okay. Um, so today, Sarah and I, as Sarah said, are going to do a bit of a double act, um, and we are going to introduce you to a couple of um, recent projects that we've been undertaking where we've been using participatory and creative methods um, to explore the topic of air pollution with people. Um, so in the spirit of participatory and creative methods, um, first of all, we'd like to get you to do a little bit of work. Um, so this is where the, the pen and paper comes in. And what we'd like you to do is spend about a minute with your piece of paper and your pen and just to draw what air pollution means to you. Um, I won't give you any more guidance apart from that. Um, but if you can get cracking with that now, and I'll give you about a minute to do it. And then um, at the end uh, of that minute, it would be nice if we can try and see what each other have drawn, and maybe hear a little bit about um, what you've drawn and why you've drawn it. Um, so I'll just let you get on with that for a moment. We need some like, elevator music, don't we, Heather? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not singing, I'm not that good. <laughs>
So hopefully you've had a chance to get something down on paper. Is that a fair enough minute or did it go quicker? <laughs> I think that was a minute. Excellent. Um, so it would be really great if you're um, able to, if you could pop your camera on and show each other what you've drawn um, in terms of what air pollution means to you. Excellent. We're getting some already. Kayla. Yeah, very nice. Henry, Sophie. Okay. Should we, Holly, we can't see yours. I'm not quite sure what's, oh yeah. <laughs> it's your video filters at the background. Um, okay. So should we pick some people? Yeah. Should we go I with think... Taylor? You were the most enthusiastic. <laughs> I, I think this is just a great activity. I, I really appreciate you you asking us to do this. Um, yeah, I mean, I tried to just um, identify um, humans, population, um, kind of integration with the natural environment, and then this this kind of like ether or just I mean, it's it's really hard to draw, but just yeah, this film um, of of air pollution through which we are all moving. Fantastic. Thank you, Kayla. Thanks for sharing that. Um, it, would anyone else be willing to share theirs and their reasoning behind drawing what they drew? We had some Henry, lovely other pictures. Henry, you looked like you had a co-worker with you. Do you want to share yours? I do, but he doesn't. <laughs> uh, so totally fine. Orson and I drew, um, you know, airborne particles going into the lungs and we kind of thought about the fact that um you know what what is air pollution is actually defined by you know its impact and um in our case we're we're obsessed by human health and and that is uh is is why we drew their lungs by the way awesome thought i was drawing a radiator <laughs> I did have a moment of thinking it was some kind of skyscraper type thing, but then I, I got my, my head into it and I worked out what it was. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Well, well done um, <laughs> to, to Henry and team um, for that one. Yeah, and I think this is just um, a really good activity just to start thinking about um, the different ways that, that people think about air pollution and what's important to you when we're thinking about air pollution. Um, I drew, personally, I drew an inhaler. So I was thinking about, well, air pollution means that I'm reaching for my inhaler. Um, so we each have a different relationship to air pollution. Um, and I think drawing is one of those methods that really cuts across different disciplines and also cuts across different cultures as well. Um, so we'll tell you a little bit more about some of the, the drawing activities that we've done in, in these two projects a little bit later on. Um, but it, it also makes people often feel quite uncomfortable, which I think is probably a good thing to get out of your comfort zone. So um, it's a good way, maybe a slightly difficult way to start the seminar. Um, but I hope you found some enjoyment in that anyway. So the first project that we're going to talk to you about today is called the Action for Interdisciplinary Air, Pollut Air Pollution Research Network project, so the Air Network. Um, and this project was funded through uh, GCRF and particularly from um, the MRC and the AHRC. And the, the aim of this funding was really to get diverse disciplinary communities together and get, get talking about global challenges. And that's what we did within this project. Um, so our team consisted of um, people from lots of different disciplines, including environmental science, um, chemistry, public health policy people, um, theatre practitioners, um, artists and all sorts of different people. <clears throat> and we focused um, our project on Makuru Informal Settlement, which is an informal settlement in Nairobi in Kenya. Um, and informal settlements, um, as many of you will know, are important areas when we think about air pollution um, because they often have a high number of sources um, of air pollution and lots of people living in close proximity and really often quite poor access to basic services. Um, so many uh, people in Nairobi and other um, big 
cities that are developing very rapidly are living in informal settlements. So in Nairobi, it's about 60 to 70 percent of residents are living within informal settlements. Um, and we wanted to give you a bit more of an idea of, of what Makuru was like and also um, some of the, the key air pollutions that are faced by residents in Makuru. So in order to do that, um, we've got Dennis Wetche, who will do a much better, um, have a much better go at introducing it than I will. And he went for a walk around his community and he took pictures of the air pollution sources that he saw. And he then combined that with um, a, a narrative of, of his experiences. Um, and I'll play that for you now, just this uh, couple of minutes video. My name is Dennis Waweru. I'm a resident of Mokuru, Viwandan, since the day I was born. In Mokuru, we face a lot of challenges in terms of pollution because first we are surrounded by polluting industry, dirty river, where all the drainages of the factory within the community end up to our river. We also have a dumping site within the community. So all the time we have burning of garbages from all over the county, others from hospitals, chemical industry, big estates, and many other places. In Mukuru, pollution is the first challenge that affect people mostly. So you found most of the children not going to school because of the effect they get during the process of burning of trashes. Bad smoke from companies, dirty environment. The other pollution is within our houses because most of the houses in Mokuru, they use charcoal or kerosene in terms of preparing meals and breakfast. So you end up inhaling the bad smell that comes out of your stove or lamp. And that smell from your stove kills you day by day slowly. So let's be our brother's keeper to raise awareness of the pollution in Mokuru. Thank you. So that, I think, gives us a really good um, starting point to think about the, the sorts of issues faced in Makuru in terms of both indoor and outdoor air pollution. Um, and here's an aerial photograph of Makuru. You can see Makuru in the centre here, characterised by the high density housing and the industry surrounding Makuru as well. So within our project then, we were aiming to build an understanding of community experiences of air pollution in Makuru using a transdisciplinary research approach that utilised creative participatory methods. And in this context, by transdisciplinary, what we really mean is that we were combining um, a very diverse disciplinary academic team with a very diverse community researcher team. Um, and they had a number of skills, including, of course, lived experience, but a number of other creative skills that they brought to the project. And it was really bringing together these two different communities to try and help us understand about air pollution um, using these creative methods. So the first step in the process was to really build our collaborative research team. Um, so we uh, spent time in Makuru, um, residents showed us around the settlement so they became the experts and we were learning um, about the, what sorts of problems they experienced in terms of air pollution and um, so we were really smelling the burning trash um, alongside them we were seeing the smoke um, from cooking and hearing the metalworking industries in action so having having those shared experiences we also played games together um, we did yoga together and I think quite importantly we, we ate together and we spent time together and we learnt about each other which was a really important foundation for having a successful project. We then went on to develop an interdisciplinary working agreement. So this outlined the ways that we wanted to work together as a team. Um, so we brainstormed together ideas for the sorts of characteristics that we wanted people within the team to have. 
And this included things like respecting other people, um, being honest, being curious, and having a sense of humour, which I think are all really important um, characteristics when you're working in particularly an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary team. All right. So after we had um, sort of agreed how we were going to work together on the project, we went on to co-design and then vote on what we called mini projects. And um, so you can see in this diagram here, I appreciate it's quite um, it's quite busy, but just working from um, left to right, um, you can see that we had four mini projects, one focusing on raising awareness of the problem, and one on co-designing solutions to the problem, one on engaging with local industries and one on engaging with policymakers. And throughout these mini projects, um, we were able to explore things like the potential behaviour changes around air pollution, but also the more um, systemic changes that were needed to reduce air pollution in the settlement. So some of the um, methods that we used um, were photography and narrative interviews, which formed um, digital stories like um, Dennis's one that you've just seen. Um, we used participatory mapping, um, we used story making, story collecting, and we used some theatre um, and policymaker workshops. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those um, next. Um, and then at the end, all of these things came together in um, what we called, or they called, a Hood to Hood Festival, which is a, basically a community led festival. And it celebrated all the different findings um, that we had throughout the project um, with different people from across the community. So I'm now going to talk about um, theatre, um, which was one of the um, one of the methods that we used. Um, so Theatre for Action was developed by Augusto Ball, um, who saw it as a method for catalyzing radical social change. Um, and he said, you can see the quote here, but I'll read it out. Um, so often a person is very revolutionary when in a public forum, they envisage and advocate re revolutionary and heroic acts. On the other hand, they often realize that things are not so easy when they themselves have to practice what they suggest. So what happens um, in this kind of theater is that you play a short scene out, which highlights a problem. And um, so in, the, in our case, we were looking at air pollution. And then the usual division between the audience or the spectators and the actors is blurred. Um, and this is by a process called spect actors. And basically the spect actors, those in the audience, step into the role of the protagonist in the play and they reenact scenes of the, of the play to test out solutions to problems. So I'm gonna talk through um, two forms of theatre. Um, that we did. One um, is, is kind of aimed at the residents of Makuru um, and this is called Forum Theatre which I'll talk about first and then the second is um, the audience members are those who have the power to make those positive systemic changes which is called legislative theatre. So I'll talk about Forum Theatre um, first of all. So Forum Theatre is where individual behaviour changes can alter the outcome of the play. Um, so these were other members of um, uh, Mukuru residents. So one of the forum pieces that you can see here, this was um, around carbon monoxide poisoning from cooking using solid fuels in people's homes. Um, we took the play around the community to the market, to the um, Reuben football field. I think field is a bit of a... Um, it's not, it's not a green field, if you're imagining a nice green football field, it's, it's red dust, um, and um, also to a community health event. And the spectators came up with lots of ideas for how to stop the carbon monoxide poisoning, including putting out the fire before bedtime and cooking outdoors. The other form of theatre that we used um, for action was um, legislative theatre. And here the spectators were um, specifically chosen because they had the power to make positive changes, um, positive systemic changes, those that are kind of beyond the individual um, uh, changes that can be made. So for exa example, in our case, we had um, local chiefs who were kind of like the, the people in charge of the different parts of the settlement, the people holding power there, community elders, um, policy makers, council members and industrialists. 
So in this scene, um, you can see the protagonist was a worker at one of the industries that border Makuru, as we saw on that map earlier, and they were experiencing health problems from working in the industrial facility. Um, and in this, this is a photograph from the scene where um, the spect spectator is the policy maker on the left. Um, he came up and took the place of the protagonist in the scene and the community member on the right was playing the part of the boss of the industry. Um, and this, this scene here is, is a kind of a typical, um, a typical dialogue. So the answer is simple, protective clothing needs to be stipulated in the employment contract. I would never sign a contract that doesn't provide this basic protection. And then the person says, well, you know, there are other people waiting for a job. Why should I hire someone who's going to make trouble for me? You know, so, so this gives you an example of showing how, how difficult some of these changes are going to be. Um, after we did this play, um, we followed it up immediately with a workshop which included all the participants. So that was the actors, the spec actors, other audience members. Um, so this was the policy makers, the industrialists, etc., local chiefs, plus also community members who'd been in the play and um, to discuss the proposals um, that people had come up with within the piece, generate additional solutions and come to a collective agreement about the sort of actions that were needed. So that was the some of the theatre work that we did and um, we also did participatory mapping and um, so we we undertook this because it's very much a bottom-up exercise to um, kind of make visible those relationships between people and the spaces in which they inhabit <clears throat> so um, some of the community members that were were artists were able to create maps of the local community and on these maps, they included um, visual references that they thought that other community members would be able to recognise and help them work out where on the map they were. And we took this around the community uh, to different locations and we gave people stickers and we asked them where they experienced air pollution. So they stuck their sticker on the map and then they told us um, about what caused pollution at that particular location and how that pollution problem could be fixed. And that enabled us to, to plot those um, different um, sites where people experienced air pollution on a map. And we could look at where there were hot spots potentially of lots of people talking about pollution. So you can see down here, for example, around some industrial areas, there's lots of dots. And up here around a dumping, a waste dumping site, there are lots of um, stickers placed as well. Um, and the, the pop-out box there gives you an example of some of the information that we collected at, at each of these locations. So in this case, the, uh, a female teacher said that at this particular location, there were insufficient toilets and dust was a problem. So she thought that roads should be tarmacked and the government should provide drainage for, for toilet, the toilet sewage. We also had a number of talented musicians on our team and, and as you saw um, from, from that slightly complicated diagram, one of the things that we were aiming to do in the project uh, was to raise awareness about air pollution. So um, some of the team came up with a song and an associated music video and this song could be um, played on the radio but it could also be performed live at community events like the Hood to Hood Festival um, and it's also on YouTube as well. Um, so if I just move that out of the way and I'll just play you a little bit of this music video so you can see the sorts of things um, that, that they were um, singing about. Wanna president, come to pick it up, come to take up on the air that we breathe in every day. I see the air polluted. Dust in the air, more smoke in the air. 
Industries here miss schools on layer Mafe mbaya kutupea Mototo wetu suize wana mali kuchizea Kwani hata bunge tu wa mwezi tutetea Hakuna vile muna kea Uduma gani muna toa Na ushuru tuna toa Kama machu mekotoa Na sigupi mikusema Tunataka hewa safi Afya gula Tunatu umia Mama umia so uh, I apologize in advance for you now having that stuck in your head for the rest of the day, but you can always go onto YouTube and, and have another watch as well if, if you'd like to. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have that stuck in my head. Thank you. Um, so um, I just want to talk a little bit about the hood to hood before moving on to our key findings from this project. So, as I said, we had a festival um, which showcased the outputs from the project. So that you saw actually in that video, some clips of Rafat and the team singing the song at the festival. Um, so we showcased outputs from the project. So we had the kind of playful activities, the music, the theatre pieces. Um, we had storytelling. We had the participatory mapping, um, uh, face painting, lots more things. So these sorts of festivals are a really common way to engage large groups of people in Makuru about issues. Um, and the community members were clearly very well practiced in organising things like the marquees, the stage, the seating for the event. And we had over 1,500 residents um, attend, which was an amazing. Um, number of people, including really, really diverse um, age ranges. So just moving on then to the key findings from the project. So the methods that we used allowed us to learn more about residents' experiences of air pollution in Makuru. And these included that there was a mismatch between what the residents um, considered air pollution to be and what researchers considered the air pollution to be. So to residents, air pollution was really heavily connected to the sensory experiences. So um, smell um, was really important as well as visuals. Um, and whereas research to air pollution was much more seen in terms of kind of particles and gases that could be measured and quantified. Um, so moving on to solutions, the solutions proposed by residents um, using these methods were really well targeted at the problems that people perceived, um, meaning that if those solutions could be enacted, they would really address those residents' concerns about air pollution. Um, and the other thing we wanted to highlight was the interconnectedness of all the issues. So while our starting point with the project was air pollution, um, air pollution couldn't be considered separately from all the other issues in the community um, that they face. So absence of opportunities, absence of basic services, for example, water and sanitation, and residents feeling of a lack of agency, a lack of ability to be able to do anything about it. Um, the other thing we wanted to highlight was the value of the project in providing space for multiple stakeholders to come together. Um, so that was the kind of community members, the researchers, health professionals, policy makers, providing space for everyone to have dialogue. Um, so building on these relationships, we were successful in another project, which we're just going to talk about um, briefly now. Um, so this project is called um, Tupamue. Um, it is led by the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and KEMRI, which is the Kenya Medical Research Institute. And it's funded by the Medical Research Council and the National Research Foundation Kenya, with some additional funds from Welcome um, for some community engagement activities. Um, and it built on our air network relationship. Um, so, so the community members who'd worked with us on the air network helped us design key elements of, um, of, of the project. So that included details, um, including the types of questions we should include in our questionnaire, um, the types of schools we should work with, which communities we should focus on. Um, and the project is doing several things, one of which is taking kind of uh, quantitative measurements um, of spir using spirometry to look at lung health. Um, of youth, um, and the other one is using um, taking air pollution measurements using purple airs, um, and then we're also conducting walking interviews, um, storytelling, and focus groups with youth, which is kind of what we're going to focus on in this talk. 
Um, so I just wanted to talk you through the storytelling work that we've been doing. Um, so this was with primary and secondary schools in um, both um, Makuru, which we've already introduced today, but also Buru Buru, which is um, a neighbouring wealthier um, community. So it's adjacent to Makuru, but it's not an informal settlement. Um, so we asked children um, in some drawings, first of all, what they liked doing when they were outside of school. And this, I haven't illustrated these here, but this was um, just a kind of a warm up exercise to get them thinking about drawing, to get them realising that it didn't really matter if they were an amazing artist or they weren't an amazing artist, but just to get them thinking about things. So then the second question that we asked them was um, when you walk to or from school do you see dirty or polluted air and can you draw a picture of your walk and the sources of dirty or polluted air or bad air um, so these are the pictures that you can see here um, so on the left um, we've got so the little um, thing at the top is illustrating that's the code for us so that we know which um, what the gender of the child was and um, what group it was in so you can see that they're illustrating a, um, a latrine a toilet um, and dirty water and we asked the children the older children if they could to write some words down explaining the picture to us which came in very handy for analysis um, and some of them were not quite so clear cut as these so you can see that this man here and these boys are smelling this dirty air that is coming from the latrine and from the from the from the river i'm realizing that i'm i'm moving my cursor around to illustrate things and you can't see that um sorry <laughs> Um, and then on the right, you can see a picture of a man who is smoking um, and they've written at the top man smoking gems and this man is smoking. So the next um, question that we asked um, the young people was, can you draw a time when you had sick lungs or somebody you know did? Was there something indoors or outdoors that caused the lungs to be sick? Um, and so we can see two different pictures here. Henry, here's a nice other picture of lungs like you guys drew earlier. Um, um, a person with some lungs, they look very happy about their sick lungs, but um, here's a picture on the right with the lungs. And on the left, it says someone was smoking and my aunt was close to the man and the smoke was, she breathed in the smoke in the air and the smoke made my aunt's lungs sick. So you can see, again, the aunt seems to be quite happy about this, but, um, but she's smoking in, she's breathing in this, this, um, this poor quality air. Um, so what we did with these, these um, images afterwards, with the actual stories afterwards, was we actually worked with the representatives from the schools themselves in focus groups and um, so we got um, six to eight children from each class um, into a focus group to actually start to categorize these stories to start the process of coding the stories and um, so the first thing we, that we got them to do was we got them to um, sort pens into categories so we took some pens along with us and we said can you sort them into whatever categories you like so some groups sorted them into different colours, coloured you know, all the blue pens together, all the red pens together, all the green pens together. Some other groups sorted them into sizes. Um, so this gave them kind of a, uh, an understanding of the need to categorise things. So then we got them to categorise the stories um, and we then used these as the basis um, for our codes um, in Envivo, which is a package that you use for doing um, qualitative analysis. So really preliminary findings from this because we haven't analysed the, the, um, the full data set. Um, yet, but the the children divided things into clean environment and dirty environment, and some of the drawings um, that were fell under clean environment were nature, clean water bodies, clean drinking water, weather, sunshine, uh, rain, and rainbows appeared under that one, and then the dirty environment. Um, these were things like toilets, rubbish, burning things people smoking, dirty river, vehicles. And then there was this other category, which um, we lumped together all the things that we didn't quite know where else to put them. So they, for example, talked about um, dog feces, about drugs, and also about sneezing. Um, but more on that um, will follow once we've done the full analysis on it. 
then uh, with the older young people within our kind of five to 18 year old sample, we wanted to understand the lived experiences of lung health and air pollution <clears throat> for those who had below normal lung function and were also symptomatic in both Makuru and Buruburu. Um, so in order to look at this, we've um, just, uh, we're just starting now doing walking interviews um, with selected people um, from Makuru and Buruburu. Um, and what we've asked them to do, we've, um, we've asked them to take us to areas in their community that they find it easier to breathe and then areas in their community that they find it harder to breathe. And then on this route, the, the kind of one, of one of the key advantages of the walking interview is that you can use prompts of things that you see on the route um, in order to generate discussion in addition to the, the questions that you're, you're asking about experiences of lung health and air pollution um, on the way. And um, we're collecting multiple types of qualitative and quantitative information while walking um, with people. So this includes data about the air pollution exposure along that route using the purple air monitor to monitor PM 2.5. We have information about the locations of the route using GPS, and we have video and audio recording of the route. So we have the recording of the interview with the young person, and also we have a video of the route. So we, that will help us in our analysis to perhaps link up what's being said um, to, to what's been seen or the prompts that have been used around the community. Um, so similarly to, to, as Sarah was saying, this is happening at the moment. So hopefully we'll have some more results from this um, at some point soon. So to kind of summarize both projects really together in terms of thinking about the, the advantages of using creative participatory methods, um, they've really enabled us to reach large and varied audiences. Um, you know, we've been able to not only, um, you know, run workshops and things and invite people into a space, but we've been able to take our methods out to people in the spaces that they are inhabiting. Um, so as we've mentioned, the football field or the market, for example. This kind of approach where we're co-creating um, research plans with community members and those that are experiencing the air pollution problems for themselves does help to support more equitable engagement in research. Um, and I say more equitable rather than just equitable, because I think that's still a long way to go. The, the methods not only um, allow people to raise awareness about air pollution, though that was a, a really nice benefit of some of the methods, but it also enables the identification of potential solutions, both at the behaviour change level, but also at the wider systemic change level. And using multiple methods together really helps us to paint this broader picture of, of how people experience air pollution. Um, and Freeman called this a collage, which I really like the idea of. It's kind of some, there's some overlap in terms of what we learn from different methods, but it's not a complete overlap. There's always something new that you learn. Um, but it's not without its challenges. Uh, it's a, it's a time-consuming approach. Um, it requires a fair amount of relinquishing of control, which I think, uh, I, well, I can't speak for everybody, but for me as a researcher, I find that quite difficult. And I think a key example of that would be the Hood to Hood Festival, where we really had no experience at all of setting up these kind of events, and it really had to be completely on the community members. And um, it requires careful negotiation of different expertise, and that's actually between the different um, disciplinary academics and also within the community researchers and then also across those different expertise as well. Uh, and it highlights the inflexibility of funding, uh, you know, when we're trying to do co-created research and, and a lot of the specifics of how things might play out are, are up in the air and we don't necessarily know what's going to happen. It's difficult to, to pitch that in a way that sounds very convincing uh, in grant funding. 
So to summarise from, from the, the, re the two research projects that we've presented, we want to thank uh, all the community researchers that have um, done so much great work within the projects, the wider residents of Makuru that have um, participated as well, and the project researchers that have been part of the Air Network and Tupamui. Um, and as Paul mentioned at the start, I also just wanted to um, flag the new uh, UKRI Regional Clean Air Champions to you in case you haven't heard of us yet. Um, so we're, we're aiming to kind of build on the work of the Clean Air Champions, which hopefully you're very aware of. So Professor Sir Stephen Holgate, Dr Jenny Baverstock and Dr Gary Fuller. Um, and they are working to champion the work that's going on within the clean air programme and beyond. Um, and the new regional clean air champions are helping them in particular regions that perhaps aren't represented so well um, by the, the institutions that they're based at. Um, so I'm going to be representing Scotland. Uh, Dr. Neil Rowland will be representing Northern Ireland. Professor Paul Lewis will be um, flying the flag for Wales and Dr Suzanne Bartington for the Midlands to the north of England. And in terms of what we're aiming to do, um, well we're aiming to engage with uh, researchers that have been funded through the, the SPF Clean Air and we want to explore ways to promote knowledge exchange between the work that's going on and potential end users. So this could include business, industry, health professionals, local authorities and the public. We also want to gather intelligence on um, what else is going on so we can see about how this could enhance the programme activity and um, help to catalyse events that are happening um, within our local areas, so for example with Clean Air Day. Identify challenges and barriers to research and innovation and communicate these to the programme and also to come up with new ideas to help enhance the effectiveness of the programme. So I think the sort of common thread that runs through all of those activities is really around communication. Um, so please do get in touch um, if you have anything that you'd like to tell us about with your respective regional clean air champion. Um, we'd love to hear from you um, and to, to get some information, information flowing in various different directions. So yeah, just to say that's who we are and please do get in touch if you're interested. And just to finish up, um, by saying thank you very much for listening and, and hearing about the, the two projects that we've been using um, creative and participatory methods in. And just from Sarah and myself, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Heather and Sarah. It's really fascinating. And we've got some interesting uh, questions uh, in the chat. Um, I guess um, one of the things that uh, struck me is that you used uh, uh, theater and you used um, song and, um, and so forth. And as, uh, as Holly Walder says, you know, it's really interesting. And do you have other creative participatory methods that you could recommend, would recommend? And why did you choose those in particular rather than, I don't know, what else? Um, mm -hmm. you know, what, what caused that choice? Oh, what caused the choice? This is going back a long way, isn't it, Heather, to the start of the project. I think it was partly um, pragmatic in terms of who wanted to come in to, and play with our team at the, right at the beginning. So there was a networking event between AHRC and MRC, um, which brought together different fields, different researchers and practitioners. So we kind of started with theatre and um, music, didn't we? Kind of represented from the creative side of things. Um, and then from our own experiences, we had the participatory mapping with the storytelling um, from that workshop as well came out from there, didn't it? But then when we were actually in Makuru and did our first workshop, we were very much kind of led by the community participants. And I noticed somebody put in the chat screen about were they paid? So yes, yes, they were paid. Um, I could talk for length at how our institution did a dreadful job of paying our participants. What a nightmare. If anyone's tried to get community payments from a UK research institution to people on the ground in, um, in uh, Kenya, nightmare. Um, Another example yeah, so, of inflexibility of funding there, yeah. yeah. 
yeah absolutely dreadful so yeah so Heather I mean we were really guided by our um, community participants weren't we on kind of their skills and their experiences we were yeah I mean we spent a lot of that that kind of initial workshop just kind of playing around with different methods trying out the theatre hearing um, some of the previous songs that had been performed and trying out some of the different methods just to kind of see see what we liked and see where the, where the interest was really. And then the final decision was really made within mini project groups and then kind of depended on, on people that they wanted to bring into the group um, based on the expertise in the room. And so it just sort of grew really um, to, and it, it kind of developed naturally itself as to, to which directions that we ended up going in. But I'm sure there's lots more that we could have included mm. if we'd had that expertise mm. within the team. Yeah, and the only other, the other kind of method, Holly, you asked for sort of any other thoughts on other methods. So um, in a subsequent project um, that we've done, which was about COVID transmission in, in, in Makuru, we used puppetry. Um, and that was a really nice um, process as well for um, engaging community members in, in the issue about that was about COVID tra transmission. So I would say it's very, very dependent on the context about what, what methods you want to use. So talk to your target audience find out what kind of they're interested in. it could be dance um it could be song whatever find out what they're interested in and take it from there in terms of what methods you want to use yeah i think that's the really key thing because we could have gone in with a preconceived idea of what the methods should be and then we would have definitely have really missed the mark in terms of what what was um you know what was of interest to people locally um, and so having the community members there to really bring that through to us made it so that you know for example with the hood to hood where we were performing lots of these different outputs from these methods and people were really really interested and in, and in, you know we had such great attendance at that and i think that is because we were using methods that were really relatable to people yeah thank you and it kind of addresses a question that kayla asked at the beginning which is about you know how did you how did you define the issue and challenges of air pollution in this particular context and and she also asked did you ever feel as though you were forcing an issue on the community and it must be a, a sensitive area i mean there's mm. you know helicoptering in and saying we'll fix this for you yeah um, and leaving again and i just yeah. wonder how you felt about that Great question, Kayla. Yeah, so shall I start, Heather, and then you can chip in. So, yeah, so sure. the project came out of um, two previous projects, or rather the community relationships that we had, we allowed from two different projects allowed us to build the air network. But so initially what happened um, was in 2005, I think, uh, no, 2015, um, 2015, um, some Makuru residents approached SEI Africa. Um, so SEI, where I'm based, we have an office um, in Nairobi and community members approached SEI Africa and said, hey, like, we're really concerned about the factory, the pollution that we think might be coming from the factories, people are getting sick, can you help us do some a study in it? So our SEI Africa office got in touch with me at the York office and my colleague Patrick Booker, who's now at GIZ in Germany and got in touch and said hey like you know can you help us with this so we got some low-cost monitors and we put them on people's backs and they walked around the settlement and we looked at kind of what the issue was which then led out to another project which Marceli Twig at CEH led um, and then those relationships that we had then led into the air network so we very felt like we'd been invited into the community and um, rather than us wanting to go and explore it. Yeah, and then there was, I was just going to add to that and say there was definitely, particularly from the environmental scientists and chemists within the team, we entered into the, the workshop in Makuru thinking, right, well, air pollution is particles and gases in the atmosphere and we can measure them using our bits of kit and we can quantify and make a nice graph. And this is this is what air pollution is. Um, but the, the conversations that we ended up having with people were so much more wide ranging in that. And really, it was about much more to do with the, the infrastructure that, you know, air pollution was a response to a number of other problems that people were experiencing in their everyday lives. And we couldn't talk about air pollution in isolation because people wouldn't be interested because that was just one, one symptom of, of something that was much wider. 
Um, so the conversations that we had ended up being much different to how we might have expected it to go, but that's the way it, it had to be. And we had to be led by what the air pollution problem was to the people that we were speaking to and not by our data and numbers that, that we thought it should be when we went in there. Yeah, thank you. And that's very helpful. And, and we have two questions which I think are quite related, one from Prashant Kumar and one from Diana Varden, basically asking if you measured the impact of using the approaches on the participants' views and perceptions, uh, or if you captured and assessed changes in people's behaviour to reduce their own exposure. Yeah, so we, um, we did to an extent. Um, so with the, the community researchers that were working on our project, we had a combination of using um, reflection diaries through the project. So we were able to understand what people were, th were thinking and feeling about the project and how it was working as we went through. Um, but we also, at a number of points, asked people um, if they'd learned anything from the project. Um, and it was really interesting from the, the community researchers themselves to see not only that they were saying things like, well, now I know that I need to put my stove outside or now I know this thing, um, but also that they felt more empowered to do something about it. Um, and not only for themselves to make changes, but to advocate for wider changes, whether that might be from other community members or from, um, you know, policymakers and, and much, much more wide than just their community. Yeah. And do you, and do you think, so this is in a particular kind of community in, in Africa. I mean, how translatable are the results and methodologies you use to other places, would you say? So I would say that the methods are absolutely translatable. Um, and I think that you like with the caveat that I said in the in response to Holly's question earlier that it's about being culturally sensitive and looking at kind of what what yeah. people local people are interested in and what what standard what you what they tend to use. Um, but I think and I think there are some elements that are transferable. So I think the importance of rely that, that the fact that people tend to rely on their senses is kind of quite important and I think that's found in many places um I know from work that was done way back in York um you know people people talked about the, the smell of things being being a really big issue um Heather have you got anything to add um I suppose just that you know there are lots of approaches that you can use and I think you know if you if you do that kind of helicoptering into any location, whether it be, you know, a lower middle income country or a high income country and think, right, well, this will definitely work. I think you're probably setting yourself up to have a bit of a shock. Um, and I, I think really testing approaches out or, or talking to people about what might work in that particular context is the way to go, even if you've, you know, come with an idea of what, of what might work yourself. You know, I think if you want it to actually work in practice, you need to, to speak to people. Mm. Okay, well, I think uh, that's uh, brilliant. There are no more questions in the chat, as far as I can see. I think you've covered everything, and I think it's been an absolutely fascinating uh, experience. I, I must say, uh, there are quite a lot of messages saying excellent stuff, and I couldn't agree more. I think it's really, really inspiring, actually, uh, to see to see working with communities and seeing change. And I think we have to do that more and more. So it's excellent. So thank you both thank you. for thank a fascinating you, presentation and for being part of this. Uh, thank you to our audience for being here and, uh, and listening in. Next week, we have a seminar from Kayla Schultz uh, from Oxford University and part of the Transition Network, one of the other uh, clean air uh, networks uh, on air quality information channels in London. Uh, when and where are they consulted? So please uh, tune in next week at uh, one o'clock uh, to hear Kayla give her talk. And again, thank you very much again to Sarah and Heather for a fascinating presentation. And uh, to all of you, have a good week and we'll see you next week, I hope.